Greetings, everyone. It's Dr. Jonathan with the Althea Center live on Sunday, June 7th. No, you can't see my face. Uh, this was my choice of clothing today for solidarity in many of the native traditions of this country, particularly in the plains, the four directions uh, medicine wheel is central to tradition and teachings. And this medicine wheel, particularly in the central part of North America, is typically red, white, black, and yellow. And it has long been understood to signify that there are many races necessary to comprise the whole of humanity. And of course, in a kind of uh, symbolic fashion, people of dark or black skin, people of red colored skin, people more like yellow and white colored skin. Obviously, these are not um, precisely our skin colors, but I think it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's an important thing to remember as we move into this very, very special topic today, asking whether there is a direct and implied or implicit connection between the maturation of spirituality, uh, spiritual awakening, and the work of anti-racism. So, welcome. It's Sunday morning. I hope you're doing all right. Uh, we got some big stuff to tackle, a story, lots of lessons. We're going to try to get it all done by about 11.15 so that maybe you're going to get outside a little bit today. Um, but we do have some announcements. We're going to start with our statement of being uh, as well uh, in a moment. And, uh, and hopefully you are sharing this and we're going to build our community together. We have to stay strong. We're looking forward to your donations. We're looking forward to your attendance. We're looking forward to you sharing what we're doing online. And yes, we have begun to wrestle with the question of when we will open, but we are also uh, a community before we are um, a business or, uh, or anything like that. So uh, safety is critical. And when we uh, typically have Sundays with about 150 people, and uh, if you consider the staff, and other people that put on Sunday programs it means we, pr we would, by law, only be allowed to have about 40 people come. Uh, it's a difficult decision. It's a difficult decision because we want to be together and, 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 and having only 40 is, is difficult. We are also researching all the guidelines requested and trying to better understand when we could be ready to meet those guidelines in terms of sanitation, in terms of safety. And so you're going to see a survey going out uh, this week, and it's going to ask you for some of your input and feelings about how we should open and when we should open. Now, ultimately, of course, the staff and the board have to make the decision because we're going to be responsible if anything goes wrong, uh, as well as all the things that might go right. Uh, but we do want to hear from you. We want to know what your thoughts and feelings are. So watch out for the survey. And when you get it, we're going to ask you to turn it around real fast. What we find is that when people sit on them and think they're going to answer them in a week or a few days or when they have time, they just don't. So we're going to give you probably like a 24-hour window. Look out for that survey. Now, speaking of growing in strength, we are continuing to offer free uh, Wednesday classes with teachers other than me, lucky you, and um, Dr. Taraz Martinez is actually quite a special woman who is an acupuncturist and, uh, and a very sort of uh, calm and healing soul to be around. She also happens to be our beloved Stephen Fordham's wife. So her class is COVID-19 from crisis to strength one hour live Facebook event, learning how to increase your energy through Qigong. So check that out, that's gonna be great. Thursday, of course, we have explorations at 11 a.m. This is all Denver Mountain time. And uh, we are doing this on Zoom now, which means the Zoom link is posted and anyone, everyone can join for free. 
We welcome donations. We're grateful for your donations. We need your donations, but everyone's welcome as long as you can get onto a Zoom call or even call in by your phone. Uh, if that doesn't work for you, you can also watch on Facebook Live. June 13th, uh, we have a special um, community service project launching. This has been at the hands of Jody Stevenson and other Althea volunteers that she's gathering. So Urban Peak and Althea are working together for donations for the homeless and in particular for homeless youth. And then you're going to see that link on the website, altheacenter.org slash Urban Peak. Just look around, you'll find it. And of course, we'll post it here in the feed. On Facebook again, free live class, Wednesday the 17th, Reverend Suzanne Hunt, who also did one of the Integrative Spiritual Practitioner programs with me, will be doing a one-hour free introduction to her healing meditation upcoming class. And then on June 24th, the class starts, and that's an eight-week class, again, with Sue Hunt, healing meditation. So there is lots going on. We are staying strong as a community. We are growing as a community. Make sure you're checking out Facebook throughout the week. We're posting uh, messages and talks that I'm doing, uh, not every day, but almost every day. Um, I actually do them on my, not to confuse you, I do them on my own Facebook page live every single day, and then we post them on Althea's page. We also have the Althea YouTube page. So if you miss Sunday services, if you miss a class, if you want a message, a meditation, I'm filling it up. So go and check that out when you find that you're in need. And I think, I think, I think, oh, I also wanted to let you know that there were many of you who downloaded my new book, Spiritual Experience. And then some of you even went on to purchase an audio collection called Spiritual Resilience it's $37 for 30 programs. They're all recorded live Althea sessions. If you have any problems with those downloads, please let me know or let Su uh, Susan know in our office. We want you to get those. I know some people had some bumps and glitches um, and we're here to help you sort that out. I thought that was important to say. Can't quite think of what else uh, to share, but I think that's good. Uh, it's getting to be like an old service where we have all kinds of announcements and uh, I think we're ready to settle in. So I'm going to invite you to uh, take a deep breath. Let's sit comfortably but alert. You're going to allow your eyes to close and to begin just in light of all the turmoil in the world. Let's just do about three to six big inhales and exhales. Really big. In, doesn't matter how you breathe, just take it in. Vigorous is good. And then start slowing down. And now we're really concentrating on the exhale. So keeping your eyes closed, spine straight, breathing in through your nose, down into the belly, and then long, long exhale. Imagine you're releasing whatever no longer serves you. As you breathe out, you can say silently to yourself, I release into the light anything that is not of the light. I release into the light anything that is not of the light or I release whatever no longer serves me. I release whatever is not for my highest good. Whatever you want to affirm, breathe it out and really work with that exhale to the extreme contraction and then a soft, gentle breath in. Staying with your eyes closed, if you will. And I thought it might be nice today to start with our statement of being, a way to affirm our unity wherever we are, whoever we are. If you're a part of the Althea community or becoming a part of the Althea community, 
This is an affirmation that binds us. It has been passed for generations in our community and originated around 130 years ago. And what it speaks to is our belief in the indivisibility of life. The indivisibility of life means that all lives matter, all colors matter, that we stand behind Black Lives Matter because we see and affirm spirit in all things. And when something on our earth cries out for balance, for help, for support, we stand with them. And so whether it's Me Too or LGBTQ or Black Lives Matter, which is of course the most pressing and important topic of the day, we affirm when we say everything is one thing, that all things are contained within and as such, we look for God and love and spirit in every day, in every moment, and we hear the voice of spirit in every cry for help. And so it was written and passed down. God is all, both invisible and visible, one presence, one mind, one power is all. This one that is all is perfect life, perfect love, and perfect substance. We are individualized expressions of God and are ever one with this perfect life, perfect love, and perfect substance. Now, if you would, I encourage you to stay with your eyes closed, for as we hold this affirmation, we must be challenged and we must ask, if everything is in God, if everything is in spirit, how can there be such imbalance? How can there be such division? And what is our role if we truly believe all is one? Do we find rest and shelter in the unity, in the neutrality? Or is it our place to speak up and speak out? So let's hold these questions. Let's hold these questions as we close our eyes and continue in prayerful meditation and meditative prayer. Staying connected to your breath. Feeling stillness and silence. And from this silence, we affirm our unity with all life. And each in our own different way, we pray together as one. to our source, the mystery from which we all come and remained held by pure existence, consciousness, to the one spirit, dear God, to today together we pray. And may we find the power for this prayer in the deepest, innermost places of our hearts and souls. Today, we send a prayer of loving support, protection, and highest good for all who stand for unity, fairness, harmony, balance, cooperation, collaboration, and the betterment of all together. 
we lift these lives and pray for the healing and transformation of those who would seek harm, violence, prejudice, bigotry, racism, sexism, all violent ideologies to those homes, to those hearts, to those minds. We offer love and we pray that they would feel in themselves the healing of the deep wounds and bitterness from which they live. We pray for the resolution and release of the fear from which they act. For it will only be together, all together, that we can create a sustainable future. For all humanity, dear God, hear this, feel this, let this radiate throughout our universe, that we long to come back into balance and alignment with our source. Dear God, we have forgotten what we are. We have overlooked our family, our brothers, our sisters, the plant nations, the animals, the waters, the air, the natural powers, our ancestors, and the generations to come. We pray today that you would heal our vision and we would lose our selfish short-sightedness, that we would lose our fear and clinging to comfort, that we, through prayers and words and actions and voting and our spending, that we will resurrect our dignity as a species on this planet, that we will live the heart of our relationship to spirit with love and wisdom as a choice every day in all situations. We pray for the caregivers. We pray for the injured. We pray for the ill. We pray for the leaders. We pray for each and everyone seeking harmony and justice today. And we pray for those who do not understand. May we awaken together, dear God, creative source. And may this prayer and this moment and our community be a radiant force in this awakening. And so we lift these prayers and all the prayers in all the hearts of everyone listening, whether now or later, we pray for each other and we long for the highest good for each other. And so together we say, Amen. So, excuse me, I'm leaning in to see who's there. Um, you know, I was thinking about telling a story today. And the interesting thing is this is a story I've told 
at the Althea Center, gosh, in the last five, six years, probably five, six times. I usually tell it once a year. Now, I'm going to try to tell an abbreviated version of the story. But what's important to me as a starting point is that we understand um, that the depth of our message and our community and the vision and the philosophy of oneness is not a culture of spiritual bypass. It is not a culture of spiritual denial. It is not a culture of spiritual privilege. It is a culture of human maturity. And that may not be something everyone's comfortable hearing, but I guess it's time that we're a little more honest with each other. And I have to say that I cannot see it as anything but maturity for any other path forward will lead us to devastation and destruction. In the end, the suffering of some will be the suffering of all. The injustice to some will be the injustice to all. And it doesn't always seem that our communities of wellness and oneness are concerned with those who aren't present, those who aren't represented, those who don't have a voice. And I'm saying we must be. We must be. Even if all the voices we stand for, all the causes we stand for don't show up, don't participate in our community, it's fine. It doesn't matter. Blue whales don't participate in our messages and we pray for them. Australia rarely shows up for our messages and we prayed for the wildfires. The prayers, the meditations, and the conversations about how to live more fully are not luxuries. They are the hard work of awakening to the oneness of all. And so the story goes. Once upon a time, a long time ago, there was a village. Maybe you can imagine a thousand years ago. Maybe you can imagine a circle of teepees not far from the Platte River. And there was a young girl who was having a difficult time in her life coming of age, still young, maybe 10, but feeling that she wanted to be older, more independent, and yet more than anything, she felt left out. Just a different kind of kid. Not like the others. Maybe too sensitive, maybe too quiet. Something was different. Well, one day when her father was preparing to go hunting, she asked if he could come, if she could come with him. And he said, no, of course not. It's too dangerous. I'm going out hunting deer and I'm going deep into the forest, into the territory of the wolves and the mountain lions. And I'll tell you, the mountain lions are our enemies and they would snatch you up and eat you for dinner just as surely as they would do anything else in the world. Well, you can imagine how this conversation goes on and on. I have a three-year-old and a 12-year-old, and I think you know how the conversation ends. He says no, she says please, he says no, she says please, she gets to go. <laughs> so off they go, you know, across the river, through the field, and to the edge of the deep dark forest. And when they get to the edge of the deep dark forest, he says, now you have to be careful. I told you this is the land of the wolves and the mountain lions, and those mountain lions will snatch you up just as surely as anything else in the world. So you have to stay close to me, and we're going to go into the forest. I'm going to put you in a clearing where it's open and safe, and you can see what's coming, and you will stay there. Do you understand? Yes, Daddy. Do you understand? Absolutely, Daddy. Will you leave that circle? No, Daddy. Will you move if you hear something. No, Daddy. Will you call me if anything changes? Yes, Daddy. Okay, come on. So into the forest they go and they walk and they walk and it's peaceful and beautiful. It's summer. 
and the butterflies are around and the light filters through the trees and they come to the clearing that he spoke of. There's a stone in the middle, dandelions here and there and other wildflowers. And he says, this is it. You stay, I'm leaving, don't go anywhere. If you go on beyond this circle, you might get captured by one of these beasts and worse, we have set up traps to catch the animals and I don't want you hurt in any way. So the dad goes, the girl stays, she picks flowers, she plays jumping games off the rock, she gathers up a pile of wood, all the sticks and fallen debris to help at home, and then she waits and she waits and she waits. And dad's gone a long time until all of a sudden she hears something. A snap in the bushes. And then large sounds of rustling and moaning. What does she do? She should call her dad, right? Does she call her dad? Dad, come quick. No, of course she doesn't. She goes to the edge of the circle where the sound is coming from. And she sees a big figure in the shadows of the trees. She knows it's no good. Should she call her dad? Of course. Does she call her dad? No, because she's a kid. So she goes through the bushes and there she sees this mountain lion like nothing she's ever seen before, powerful body and huge long fangs pulling at the knots in the trap that was set locked around her paw. Just then the mountain lion looks up and sees the little girl. Wait, the mountain lion says, because of course this was back when animals and people could speak and animals had magical powers and people could, you know, understand what they were saying and you, you know the deal. Wait, says the mountain lion. Come closer, won't you, my dear? And the little girl says, well, I don't know. My daddy said you're our enemy. My daddy said you would eat me. My daddy said we can't trust you. I'm going to call my daddy and he's going to look after you. And the mountain lion says, no, no, wait. What are you talking about? Do you believe everything you're told by your parents? You think all animals are bad? No, please. You're too young to live from fear. Come closer and set me free. And then I will give you a gift. A gift? Yes, something magical, something that will change your life. Well, you kind of get the idea. It's all back and forth. And eventually, the girl needs to call her father. So, no, she doesn't. She unties the paw. The mountain lion is free. She rises up on her front legs, mighty, powerful, fierce beast and just like that she leans forward and what do you think did you hear this one before if you said she eats the little girl shame on you this is an Althea broadcast we don't roll like that no she leans forward she licks the little girl on the cheek and she says how could I possibly help I am a mother of seven small kits. I'm hunting just like your father. I would do anything for them. And because you've saved my life, you have saved theirs. What can I do? And she says, well, you know, uh, I don't know. Things aren't too great for me at home. I don't feel like I'm smart like the other kids. I don't feel beautiful like the other kids. I don't feel strong like the other kids. I don't feel liked like the other kids. I mean, what do you got? Mental, emotional, physical, spiritual, I'm having a hard time here. So the mountain lion says, ah, I think I got something for you. Take one of my eyelashes, pluck it out, put it in the palm of your hand, rub it together, wipe your eyes. 
And from that moment forward, you will always see the truth, the absolute truth. How does that sound? Could be good for work, could be good for school, could be good for friends. Mm, mm, mm. So the little girl says, sure, sounds great. Thank you so much. She plucks it out, puts it in her hand, rubs her, whoop, whole thing. She looks up and like that, the world somehow feels changed. Things are a little bit luminous. And as she looks to that mountain line, she sees her big, hulking, fierce body. But like an inner vision, like a daydream, she also sees the kits in the den at home. And she knows that that mother was telling the truth. And she knows that the gift is working. So with that, they embrace, they part ways. The little girl goes back to the circle. She sits on the stone. Uh, more time passes by. The dad comes. Hello, how's your day, my girl? And of course, she says, fine. And he says, well, what did you do? She says, nothing. Really? Yeah. Oh. And so off they go. They start walking home. She's got her bundle of uh, wood and a few flowers. How was your day, she says to her dad as they walk uh, out of the forest. Oh, he says it was quite the heroic day, quite the heroic day. I didn't, I didn't catch anything in the end, but boy, I saw this big stag could have fed the village for a month. And I was, I was running and chasing and going through canyons and, and shooting arrows and just missed them, just missed them. But the little girl had that daydream again an inner vision. She heard his words, but in her heart she knew he was lying. It wasn't the truth. The truth, as she could see it, was that he spent the day chasing rabbits, feeling defeated, fell asleep under a tree. Not much good. But she saw more as she paid attention. What she saw was that in his heart of hearts, he wanted nothing more than for her to feel safe and looked after and to know that he would feed her one way or another every day that she was under his care. And so they went back home and the gift continued to blossom. As they came into the village, a little boy who'd never paid her any attention before came running. Hey, hey, why don't you come play with us, he said. But immediately she could see the truth. He wanted the bundle of wood. He wanted to steal it. She knew he was up to no good, but she continued to listen and pay attention. And she realized that in his home, it was always work. It was always labor. He never had the freedom to play. And he just wanted to be a kid. So she gave him the bundle of wood and said, well, I can't play today, but Take my wood, maybe you'll have less chores today and you can play longer. And he was elated. She became his friend instantly. And the same thing unfolded throughout the village. She could see everyone, everyone was wearing a kind of mask, showing one face to the world, but another story inside. At first it was disturbing because it seemed like everyone was lying. But the more she paid attention and as the days and weeks unfolded, the more she came to learn that the face that people showed the world was the result of what they carried inside. Their stories, their pain, their experiences, their joys. That what people showed on the outside didn't always show who or what they were on the inside. But sure as anything, everyone had a story inside. Everyone had pain and everyone had gifts. And they say that she started to live by that vision and treat people according to that beauty and pain that she could see. And very quickly her life changed because being with her was a healing experience, a hopeful experience. Something about this girl just felt affirming in the most amazing way. 
and they say that as she got older and older, she only became more magnificent in her compassion and grace and goodness to all. And they say that as she got older and as she became a great healer and leader in the village, something began to emerge in the strength of her vision. Not only could she see what people showed, not only could she see what was hiding, but she could then see something else. The spirit of life, like a light in every human, in every creature, in every tribe, in everything. And so the legend goes that she became the most celebrated and revered healer, teacher, and leader that her community had ever known, still to this day. Now, what does this have to do with protism, protism, protests about racism in America today? What does this have to do with sexism or homophobia? What does this have to do with political division? The idea, or the lesson, I should say, because it's more than an idea. To me, it's truth. It's an experience. The lesson is that as we evolve on the spiritual path, as we commit to spiritual growth beyond religion, beyond culture, beyond an externally imposed religion, as we awaken to the spirituality of self and life, we start to see things differently. We come to realize that the outer picture is never the whole story. We think there's equality, but there's not. We think we understand the aggressors, but we don't. We think that our way of seeing things is the way other people should see things, but it's not. As the little girl in the story discovered through the magic of confronting the collective fear, right? Now that's an important part of the story. She breaks from tradition and the social illusion that the animals are enemies, that the mountain lion is an enemy. And in the same way, our transformation begins spiritually as we break with the cages of fear that we are all living within. The cages of fear that keep us from speaking our truth, sharing our passion, honoring our gift, or for that matter, seeing other people truly for who and what they are, regardless of race, age, gender, lifestyle. So in breaking this fear or this social ignorance, she's given a gift, as you will be too. As you learn to listen to the wisdom of life itself, as you learn to listen to those who call to be heard, you will receive a gift. You will come to know humanity more fully. You will come to know yourself more fully. And as that begins to unfold, the pain and the gifts that we all carry will become quite apparent. The simple reality is no one's all bad. No one's all good. We're all mixtures of the two. Yeah, in different degrees, true. And yes, the hidden story accounts for it all. And so we continue the journey and like the little girl, ultimately end up in the stillness, in the center point, in the maturation of our vision where we come to know in our hearts that all life, all humanity is both diverse 
and connected, different and unified. It's interesting, I'm reading a, a book with my little girl, it's her favorite book, it's called My Amazing Body, It's probably written for older kids, but it's all about a, a little girl who just describes her body, you know, the parts that you can see and the parts that you can't. I have a skeleton, I have bones, I have muscles, I have veins and arteries and, and so on, but you don't see that because I have my skin. And she talks about how on the outside we can look really different and how amazing that is. Different eye colors and hair colors and skin colors. How beautiful and rich the world is. We are so different. And yet, she also affirms that on the inside, we're very much the same. We bleed the same red blood. We need the same medicine when we face COVID-19 or heart disease. We are united and richly diverse. And what we start to uncover as the healer in the story uncovers is that it is from this place of knowing the truth of our unity that our ability to embrace our diversity arises, is refined, and ultimately blossoms. But there's more to this because on the spiritual path today, especially the modern spiritual but not religious path, there is a great passion for self-care. There is a great passion for peace. There is a great focus on ending stress and being happy. And I got I to gotta tell you honestly, I never really thought that's what spirituality was about. A life without stress? A life always happy? Where would that be? No friends? No relationships? Everyone does what you want all the time? And you are so disconnected from the human body and emotion that you only experience the equanimity of the stars, which themselves are fiery beasts that burn out in time. Mm, I don't know. It's my experience that awakening to oneness is about freedom. Freedom of consciousness, freedom of heart, freedom to be who and what you truly are, freedom to know that whatever arises, joy, sorrow, pain, riots, transformation, political upheaval, communities coming together, change underway, whatever happens, you are welcome to engage it with choice. That seems to be perhaps the greatest gift of the spiritual journey. And it comes from focusing on the soul's purpose, which is to learn. And when we stay rooted in oneness and willing to learn every day and make conscious choices in alignment with what we're learning and the unity we come from, then we discover that being spiritual isn't enough. Being at peace isn't enough. Being happy with the way things are isn't enough. Not from a place of morality or ethics or culture, but from the mere arising of the wisdom and consciousness of spirit itself. And so we come to the final point of our journey today, the final point of our message which is that it's not enough to be welcoming to others. It is not enough to tolerate others. It is not enough to say that I wouldn't judge anyone who I came into contact with. If we stay rooted in the oneness of life, Find our courage and strength there. And from that place, move into deep listening and awareness. 
then we hear something more. Like the little girl in the story that became the great healer, we hear the cries for help. And not just in the world, not just from Black Lives Matter, not just from whatever our media is turning its attention to in the moment, but from our own heart. In that moment of spiritual maturity, we realize that the pain of one affects all. The oppression of one diminishes all. And yes, it is a rocky road to recovery. And I have been only in a small way compared to those who are truly the experts. But I've been involved with restorative justice. I've seen it in prisons and communities. I've been involved with Native American communities for decades. And I understand that there is so much more to what is ahead than I could possibly understand. And that it's not about my ideas. It's not about the way I want the world to look. It's about learning to awaken to the gift of this girl in the story that we must begin by listening. Listening to each other, anyone and everyone and everything. What is the story of the bird? What is the song of the tree? What is the message of your neighbor? And what is the cry on the street? And from there, we must act. As I say, it's not enough to say everyone's welcome, but to take a step, to change policy in your business, to change patterns in your shopping, to change the way you vote and the way you help make sure other people vote, whatever it is but help other voices to be heard. And if you have any privilege, any power, ask yourself, how can I use this to make the world a better place? How can I share this? How can I give this? And how can I accept that maybe I'm going to be asked to have a little less, get a little less, in order to truly listen, see, feel, and be a part of Harmony Restored. So that's it for today, folks. It's, uh, it's a crazy, crazy uh, world we're living in, um, but it's good. It's a time of great change, and we can't let it go by. My God, if we didn't see the COVID quarantine come and start with conversations about unity and getting back to nature and then it ends with people divided over who wears a mask and who doesn't and each insulting the other come on that's pathetic it's pathetic it's pathetic to be stuck at home for two months and spend two months praying and meditating on unity and then end it by throwing it all away and so life delivers us another lesson. You didn't get it from quarantine. You didn't get it from a third of the world's deaths due to COVID happening in one country. Okay, then, George, you're on. And people may not realize it or see it or know it, but George, it's time to fulfill one of the greatest missions that anyone's had in this country in the last hundred years. And thank God for his sacrifice and thank God for his family that understands that this is the beginning of something that we can all be a part of. And please don't let it end with a slogan, a t-shirt, or a few hours at a march. It's got to change behavior. So with that, we come to a close. And I'm going to share two readings that I've really been, well, there are two prayers that I've really appreciated and enjoyed this past week. 
So you may have heard them, but I think it's a good and important way to end. Before I share them um, and close out, I want to thank you for being here. I want to thank you for your donations. Donating to Althea while our doors are closed is critical. It makes all the difference in the world so we can stay strong, so we can create a place, a harbor, for those who want to see, feel, and know harmony and peace and take this journey with others. Your donations mean the world, as well as your activism, as well as your learning, as well as your prayers, your meditations, and whatever place you stand on these issues, may you be blessed, may you be guided, and may you learn to listen. And so we conclude. If you like, close your eyes. Let's take a deep breath. Let's feel these final readings together. The recipient of the Right Livelihood Award in Malaysia, Anwar Fazal, wrote, We all drink from one water. We all breathe from one air. We rise from one ocean and we live under one sky. Remember, we are one. The newborn baby cries the same laughter all over the world. The laughter of children is universal. Everyone's blood is red and our hearts beat the same song. Remember, we are one. We are all brothers and sisters, only one family, only one earth. Together we live and together we die. Remember, we are one. Peace be on you, sisters and brothers. Peace be on you. And last, the prayerful plea of Nelson Mandela upon becoming president of South Africa after nearly three decades in prison for being black and wanting justice. The time for healing of the wounds has come. The time to build is upon us. We pledge ourselves to liberate all our people from the continuing bondage of poverty, deprivation, suffering, gender, racism, and other discrimination. There is no easy road to freedom. None of us acting alone can achieve success. We must therefore act together as a united people for reconciliation, for nation building, and for the birth of a new world. So thank you one and all. Let's stay strong, let's stay together, and let's remember that we need each other.